I interviewed uh, one of the uh, Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist. Her name is Sister Teresa Christie, who we'll talk a little bit more about. But the, uh, you might see them running around on campus. There are four of them actually here at CUA. And they are kind of house moms. They, they live in the dorms, uh, two in one place, two in the other, and uh, help minister to the, the female students on campus. So that's how I got to know them. Um, I have loved meeting them over the course of the year here, and so Sister Teresa Christie was good enough to sit down with me. Uh, as it says there, they are a religious institute of diocesan right uh, of the Diocese of Lansing, Michigan. Their mother house is currently in Ann Arbor. So first, a little bit about St. Dominic, who their congregation is uh, ultimately spiritually founded by. St. Dominic was born in 1170 in Spain. Uh, interestingly, his mother had a sort of a, a vision before he was born. The, the vision actually says that she had a vision that she would give birth to a dog which, with a torch in its mouth. Um, so you can see that little statue I took there is in Franciscan Monastery where I live. And so you see the little dog with the torch in his mouth. Uh, Dominic, Dominicus, Domini, Canus, the dog of the Lord uh, is where his name comes from uh, because his mother had a vision that her son would go out and literally bark or speak the, the gospel uh, all over the place, uh, all over Europe. And so uh, she was right. The Holy Spirit uh, answered her prayers and uh, St. Dominic uh, went on to uh, really kind of help spread the faith all over Europe, as we'll see, as a, a mendicant order of preachers. Um, his, his mother is actually a blessed too, Jane of Aza. So Dominic got his start as a canon regular, and this will be important for when he founds his order. So he lived kind of, as we know, canons live a sort of a monastic life surrounding a cathedral, a uh, cathedral chapter. So he was a canon. He also, uh, Sister Teresa said, was familiar with the Norbertines and monastic life. So he lived a, a kind of a monastic life as a canon, but also as, as a priest of the cathedral, he, he lived a pastoral and active life as well. And that'll be important for uh, the Dominican order. He, uh, he is most famous for having fought against the Albigensian heresy in France. He got very concerned about this heresy that was spreading over France. And um, part of the problem was that the official preachers who were coming were dressed in really fine clothes and robes, and the Albigensians were preaching simplicity, so the, the people were favoring the Albigensians. So Dominic wanted to found a community of, of poor people, mendicants, uh, that would dress simply and just be very well educated to preach the gospel and combat this heresy. Uh, and so in 1215, he begins the order of preachers uh, so that they can literally go around in their, their poor habit, which he, he took kind of from being a canon. He wore white as a canon, so that's what he gave to his order. And he gathers lots of people around him. And by 1217, he's got about 20 brothers that have, have joined the order. And this is one of the, the most important moments in the Dominican order that kind of defines them for the future. And we'll see when we look at particularly the Dominican sisters, they really live this charism out because when he got to 20 brothers, which to us seems kind of small for a religious institute, he had a vision from the Holy Spirit that he was to send them out, what is known in the Dominican family as the dispersal of the brethren. Uh, so he decided that even though they were small and new, that it was time for them to leave their house that he had created and send them out. And so they went out in groups uh, to make new foundations uh, in various places uh, around Europe. Uh, and that happened on August 15th, 2017. And he dies uh, August 6th in 1221. So that's a little bit about the history of St. Dominic, but particularly that, that spirituality of monasticism, some elements, as well as active uh, life we'll, we'll see in future Dominicans, mm -hmm. as well as this idea of dispersal and, and going out. So Dominican sisters in America. It's interesting, uh, I didn't know anything about the, the history of the Dominican sisters in America, but unlike some of our other religious orders, like for instance, Sister Chiara's that was founded in Europe and then they came to America, uh, the Dominican sisters are all homegrown. There were no Dominican sisters that came from Europe to start congregations in America. Rather, there were Dominican friars that were here, and Dominican Sisters in America really get started in 1822 uh, when the bishop, well, not the bishop, in this case, it was actually just the parish priest, a Dominican friar uh, in Kentucky, 
decided that he needed women religious to help evangelize the frontier at that, at that point. Kentucky, you might remember, was in addition to the diocese on the East Coast when we split under Baltimore, Bardstown, Kentucky was the uh, frontier diocese out there. So Kentucky was way out there and this priest said he needed sisters. Uh, so he recruits and asks around his parish if there would be women who would be willing to follow the order of St. Dominic and become Dominican sisters. There were nine local women who answered his requests to become Dominican sisters. Uh, Mother Angela Sansbury, not Lansbury, Sansbury, uh, is, is on the screen there. She um, is one of the nine, and uh, the Dominican sisters look to her as kind of the foundress of Dominican sisterhood uh, in America. She was the first mother superior of a congregation, the congregation of St. Catherine of Siena in Kentucky. Uh, from Kentucky, uh, the bishop in Ohio uh, asked if, after they'd gotten kind of big down there in Kentucky, if they could spare a few sisters to come up to Ohio and found a school. And so four sisters in 1830 left Kentucky and went to Ohio and started St. Mary's Academy. Eventually, this second kind of foundation, which started as a, a sort of a mission from Kentucky, uh, becomes its own institute, and it becomes the Dominican Sisters of St. Mary of the Springs. And this kind of procedure of they go out in a mission, but then eventually become their own institute, we'll, we'll see kind of repeated uh, over and over. Um, it's a little bit different than maybe some orders might do it. Some orders might have a, you know, there might be one institute with a strong central mother house and then lots of other foundations of the same institute. You can see right away the, the very first separation of the Dominican sisters in America, they went off and formed a separate institute uh, eventually. And we'll, we'll see that repeated uh, throughout history. Continuing that string then, um, in Nashville, the bishop in Nashville saw that the sisters were doing really well in Ohio and asked if the bishop in Ohio could spare a few sisters to come down to Nashville. So in 1860, four sisters, Again, we'll see four sisters is pretty common, leave Nashville, and, uh, leave Ohio, and they go down to Nashville and found the Dominican Sisters of St. Cecilia. Uh, and so the, the superior there is Mother Frances Walsh, uh, who is there in the picture. And um, in their case, again, they kind of create a separate entity. They officially become a Dominican entity again, a Dominican order in 1913. And then in 1948, they would finally become a, a pontifical right institute in their own sense. So we kind of see we've gone from Kentucky to Ohio to Nashville. And I do that because that's kind of the patrimony, the heritage of where the Dominican Sisters of St. Cecilia came from. Uh, they're in Nashville, Dominican Sisters of St. Cecilia, and the Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist, who I'm talking about today, they came from Nashville. So that's kind of the, the family tree, if you will. Um, since the, the history of the sisters in Nashville is very important for uh, the Ann Arbor Dominicans, their history is kind of the same. Um, I mentioned someone that they look forward or look back to as really a really important member in their history, and that is Mother Marie William McGregor. She was in charge, the superior of the Nashville Dominican community uh, at the time of Vatican II, what the sisters look to today, and so it was a very, very important time uh, for their community. Um, Mother Marie created special study groups to look at Perfecta Caritatis and look at what the Second Vatican Council was asking uh, religious women to do, and it was a, a great time of discernment. It, it sounds like uh, it, it was a really uh, life-giving time that they spent a lot of time reading the documents and, and praying, and it was interesting because uh, Mother Marie, uh, they say today that had it not been for her, the, the Institute would probably not exist. Uh, because she was a very strong leader at the time, and she expressed to her community that she believed that as she saw the other communities around America making drastic changes to their religious way of life, that she thought if they did that, that it would be, it would be the end, that they, they wouldn't be able to survive. And so I, I read a lot of her writings, and um, she's got some very beautiful reflections about their traditional religious life. And ultimately, Mother Marie, uh, 
resolves that they're going to remain faithful to their traditional way of life with contemplation, community, and, and obviously they, they keep wearing their religious habit. But that was a very important time for the, the sisters, uh, a turning point for them, they, they see it. Um, as, a, as a result of this, the person who succeeds Mother Marie is the person on the left there, that is um, Mother Assumpta Long. She became the next superior of the Nashville Dominicans uh, after Mother Marie. And uh, I had a chance to, to meet um, some of the Nashville Dominicans and, uh, when I was in Chicago and, and talk with them. And they really credit Mother Assumpta too for the success of their order in Nashville. They said at one point, um, there was a lot of pressure because other women religious groups were, were going in a certain way and Mother Assumpta wanted them to keep wearing their habits, continue daily prayer life in common and all these things. And eventually the sisters told me that it was put to the community that Mother was going to let them go. If you want to leave, she said, you can go, uh, but, but we're not going to change what we're doing. And she said that over half of the community actually left at one point to go join other institutes and, and leave the Nashville Dominicans. But with kind of like biblical times where you send half the army away, she, she let half of the community go and with what was left, re rebuilt what we have today to the point that it got so big uh, in Nashville that in 1997, Mother Assumpta and three other sisters, the ones you see there, um, decide to go off in Dominican spirit, make a new foundation. And Cardinal O'Connor, who you see there from New York, um, invited them to come to New York. Mother Assumpta, Sister Risa told me, had, had helped Cardinal O'Connor with the foundation of the Sisters of Life. Um, at, at this point, Mother Assumpta was, was very well known. She helped found the Congregation of Major Superiors of Women Religious that we, we just talked about. Um, so she goes and they, they choose Sisters of Mary, a mother of the Eucharist, for their, their new order as their name. Interesting, notice it's not Dominican sisters because in this case, they actually received a year ex claustration to leave Nashville and then their new entity, they were a public association of the faithful. Uh, so they weren't Dominican officially. And this is where uh, my canonical hat was kind of on and Sister Teresa didn't know a whole lot about this, but it's interesting, they were created a public association of the faithful, right? these four sisters, right away in New York. So that, that's a lot of confidence, obviously, that Cardinal O'Connor had in them, but Mother Assumpta, Sister Teresa Christie said, was pretty famous at this time. So they, were, they had no problems, they knew what she was going to do and what the goal was. So um, interestingly though, I, I asked her, so even though they weren't Dominican at this point because they're not affiliated, they, they kept wearing their habits, which um, I, I don't know if that's actually canonically correct, that as not a Dominican group, they would wear the Dominican habit, but they did. Uh, and it didn't take too long before they, they were, in fact, uh, made uh, an official Dominican organization. But interestingly, they were only in New York for about three months. And uh, they were starting to get too big. <laughs> and they wanted to establish a, a major mother house. And they got invited by the Bishop of Lansing, Michigan. Uh, and especially with the help of Tom Monahan, the Domino's Pizza founder who has done incredible lot of Catholic philanthropic work. He basically offered to help them build their mother house, had several private schools that he had started that he wanted them to teach at. So um, through a, a major benefactor, Tom, Tom Monahan, they come to Ann Arbor and build this mother house, which you see there. Um, they become a public association of faithful again, because as a diocesan public association in New York, it doesn't of course carry over. And so they're once again a public association and they build their house there. And then in 2002, they officially are aggregated back to the Dominican order. Now this is kind of interesting because I didn't exactly understand how this worked. Um, Dominicans, I guess, are, are very kind of protective about who can call themselves Dominican. So you, you can't just start a group that says, well, we want to follow St. Dominic as a third order. Uh, you're not a Dominican third order until the superior general of the Dominicans actually writes a decree that says you can be officially aggregated to the Dominican order. Now it's interesting because there's no governance involved in that. The superior general of the first order in Dominicans has no uh, spot in the governance structure of any of the Dominican third order groups, but it's kind of a spiritual sharing. Uh, Sister Teresa Christie said, it means we can wear the Dominican habit and we get OP after our name. 
because we're officially Dominicans. Uh, and that happened in 2002. And then just this last year, Bishop Boyer uh, elevated them to a diocesan right religious institute. So finally, they're a religious institute once again. And um, they're currently in the process, obviously, of trying to become pontifical. I asked Sister Teresa Christie, you know, what, what they hope to gain by that, like specifically. And as we'll see, they have little missions all over the place. And since they're diocesan, right, Bishop Boyer has to actually kind of oversee that a little bit. So they said it's, it's, it's difficult for him because we're getting so big that it would be easier if we were pontifical, right, and, and under the, the congregation uh, in Rome and that one bishop wouldn't have to be uh, completely over them. So they're in the process of hopefully becoming pontifical, right. So um, a little bit about their structure. They, they have no uh, provinces. There's the mother house. And then they have 13 different missions where they've, just like we saw with St. Dominic, they've got like four often or sometimes five sisters that they've, they've sent out on a mission, uh, as we'll see normally to teach in a school or something like that. Uh, they've got the mother general, who is Mother Assumpta. Uh, she is their foundress along with the other three, and she's the current mother general. One of the other foundresses is the vicarist general. And then there's, there's a prioress who kind of runs the day to day uh, of, of the, uh, the monastery. They do have a general council of five sisters, and at each of the mission sites, there's a mission superior. So like the, the, the four sisters here, Sister Stephen Patrick is their mission superior. Uh, as their members, they have uh, 121 uh, total members, including the, the postulants, which aren't really canonically members, but 54 in final vows, 35 in temporary vows, 18 novices, 14 postulants. Uh, the youngest of the sisters is 18, and the oldest is mother, which Sister Teresa Christie said her age is to remain a mystery, <laughs> although she knows she wouldn't tell for the presentation. Uh, the average age of the sisters is, is 29, uh, so that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, since they're sent out on mission, there's about 35 of them that live at the mother house, and the others are scattered all over in groups of four or five around the country, and even some in Rome. Their formation, um, so they, their first year, their postulants, you can see the postulants are the ones they wear the little blue, and then second year is when they are uh, officially their canonical year of novitiate, and they're the ones in white behind them. Uh, their third year, they say, is optional to do an apostolic year, but pretty much that's the rule these days, that everyone does the apostolic year as a novice. And at the end of the third year, then, they would make temporary vows. And so they make temporary vows first for three years, and then they would renew them again uh, for two more years of temporary vows for a total of five and then make final profession. Their vows, uh, they promise the standard evangelical councils of poverty, chastity, and obedience. They don't take any additional vows. Uh, they're, they're simple vows, not solemn vows. Even though the, the code doesn't use those words today, we understand uh, what that means. Um, and interestingly, so when there were just a, uh, a public association, their, their vows were technically private vows. So just this last year when they became official diocesan institute, of course, now they make public vows, so uh, Sister Teresa Christie said that this last year they all renewed their vows now publicly as public vows in a religious institute for the first time. And so that's Mother, Mother Assumpta there in, in the picture, and uh, one of the sisters making her final profession but with her, her hand on the, the Bible there. Interestingly, Sister Teresa Christie said that's one of the great things about the institute right now, that all four foundresses are still alive and uh, are able to really help guide the institute. Uh, they, they do wear the Dominican habit. So as I said, uh, it came originally from St. Dominic, who wore white as a, a canon uh, of the cathedral. And so he gave that habit to the order. Um, the, the scapular, so the, the white cloth that they wear that goes all the way down to the floor and front and back, you can kind of see their scapulars. They're white too. There's their scapular. Um, the, the scapular was actually given directly by Our Lady to the Dominican order to uh, Blessed Reginald of Orléans. And uh, so it's, uh, their scapulars are blessed, Sister Teresa Christie said, so they can kiss their scapular and again a plenary indulgence, one of the, the privileges of their order. And they also wear their rosary at their belt. As you might be aware, the Dominican order uh, was especially given the promotion of the rosary by Our Lady as one of their, their great uh, missions. Uh, the sisters forget their new habit when they, and their religious names when they become novices. So there's, there's all the postulants right before the the ceremony where they become novices. So you can see they're all holding their habits and they're all very excited because they're, they're about to find out their names and uh, to become novices. And they, as we saw, wear, 
wear white veils uh, during their time as a novice. The, you can tell the Dominican sisters from Ann Arbor, the Dominican sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist, uh, because they have the little chain that they wear around their neck with this little metal on it. Notice it kind of, it's got the star of St. Dominic, so they're Dominican. And it's got Mary, who's holding baby Jesus, so clearly she's a mother. And then you've got the chalice with the host behind it, Mary, Mother of the Eucharist, and then 1997 when they were founded there. So they look a lot like the Nashville Dominicans, since they wear almost the same habit because that's where they came from. But the Ann Arbor sisters have the little necklace. So that's how you can tell them apart. Very important. So a little bit about their, their life in the Institute. Um, when I asked Sister Teresa if they were active or contemplative, uh, she said, well, we're both. We're, we're active contemplative. Um, because like St. Dominic, uh, they have some of those monastic sides, uh, but also some active sides. So they say contemplation is first. So every day begins with a Eucharistic holy hour. That's something that they say they do that like Nashville doesn't because they're Dominican sisters and Mary, mother of the Eucharist. So they start with a holy hour every morning. Um, and also since they're Mary, mother of the Eucharist, they make the total consecration to Jesus through Mary, uh, according to St. Louis de Montfort. And so they renew that every day as a part of their communal prayer, and of course they, they pray the office together. They, they chant it. Um, you might have, they, they actually pray, the four of them here in the mornings in, in Caldwell, and they have a number of the students that come join them to, to chant the office. Um, they, they eat together in silence, so that's one of those monastic traditions that they've kept. So they, they also follow the tradition of sacred reading during the meals and other monastic traditions like the daily orarium and grand silence at night. And so although they're out and active during the day, uh, in the monastery, they, they live a monastic kind of traditional life. Uh, they, they also have work and jobs that they do. So they maintain the novices, especially I saw have in their schedule house duties uh, every day. And uh, in addition to their white habits, they have these little blue aprons that they put on because hey, who wants to wear white all the time when you're working? Their apostolate is primarily teaching. Uh, so that's what they were founded for in America, especially. And so they'll go out and teach children, schools, grade schools, high schools, colleges. Interestingly, though, Sister Teresa Christie said that, you know, well, that's important, that they also still recognize St. Dominic's call to go and evangelize adults. So they go out and they do speaking. Uh, to give presentations and are, are very itinerant and, and go around basically wherever they're asked to help spread the gospel in the spirit of St. Dominic II. Uh, so to do that, they have to be very well educated. St. Dominic really was devoted to study and, and wanted his sisters and, and his friars to be very well educated. So all of them get degrees in teaching, but then most all of them, she said, also get master's degrees in some kind of related field. Um, so that's Sister Stephen Patrick, who's here at CUA. Um, she's a doctoral student now, but that's her, when she got her master's degree. Um, so very well educated sisters in the spirit of St. Dominic. They also like to have fun. So they have built into their day every day some, some chances for fun. And you might wonder, gosh, what could a sister you know, do for activity if they're, if they're always wearing their habits? Because they do. Uh, they always wear their habits. So how much could they really do? when they're you know, stuck in, in habits, can they, can they do a lot of sports and stuff? Well, I found a few things that they offer for recreation. So they play baseball, basketball, hockey, more hockey, ping pong, uh, bowling, kayaking, mountain climbing, that's a sister with her brother, Ice skating, they're very nice figure skaters. Uh, kickball, something with scooters and tennis balls, I'm not really sure. Uh, snow angel making, uh, snow fort making, oh, watch out. Uh, golf, croquet, horseback riding, gymnastics, swimming, and even beach volleyball. So they, they have a lot of different uh, things that they do for fun. And uh, the sisters were quick to point out that it's easy because you can, you can kind of see here, she says, our habits pin up. So they, they pin their, their habit up so that they are more free to play volleyball. Uh, this is Sister Teresa Christie, who was so gracious to, to sit down with me. Um, she wanted to be a sister since she was in seventh grade when she met John Paul II uh, when he came to St. Louis. But then when she went to college, the University of Dayton, she said she kind of fell away from the faith. She liked to party a lot, so she would be a good one to probably talk to about her BC days, like Sister Chiara, 
Sounds like she had a lot of fun in college. But uh, that left her kind of down at some point. And she met a Dominican sister uh, at Dayton who really kind of helped her. And um, she said that kind of planted the seed a little bit of her Dominican vocation. She graduated with a, a degree of history uh, from the University of Dayton. Her junior year, she said, she attended one of the discernment retreats that the, uh, the sisters do. Uh, I found pictures of these discernment days. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. They, they have like a limit of 180 girls that they will take for the weekend. And the others are on the waiting list. So I don't know how long the waiting list is, but the, their Facebook page is filled with pictures of these discernment retreats that are all full of 180 high school and college age girls that are interested. So that's how Sister Teresa found the Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist. She had looked at the, uh, the martyrs in, in Alton too, and, and also uh, some other groups, but ended up going there. Her senior year, she decided that she wanted to enter. So she requested papers to join, but she still wasn't really sure. So she, she told me, the thing that really pushed her over the edge, she was in an airport one day flying somewhere uh, with the papers with her trying to decide. And a woman sat down next to her who was actually from Albi, France and uh, was actually a pretty much a modern day Albigensian. She was firmly into that heresy. And so Sister Teresa Christie evangelized her there in the airport. And she said, that was pretty good conviction that, you know, I'm probably supposed to be Dominican since an Albigensian just sat down next to me uh, in the airport. Um, so she became a postulant with 600 women. There were seven of them in 2008. Uh, her name, uh, Sister Teresa Christie, she really fell in love with St. Teresa of Avila. Uh, so um, learned a lot about her, loved St. Teresa. And so I asked her, you know, if you got to pick a name or she said, well, technically Mother Superior picks the name, but they get to submit like three. And her novice master basically told her, just submit Teresa three times. <laughs> but, um, so she was pretty sure she was going to get that name. But interesting, St. Teresa of Avila is, of course, St. Teresa of Jesus. They don't do of names in her institute. So she kind of snuck it in with the, the Latin there, Teresa Christi, Teresa of Christ, um, so that she could be like St. Teresa. She's already completed her first three years of temporary profession. And this last year, she renewed her vows. And so she's in those last two years of temporary profession. She's here getting her master's degree in history. That's her with uh, Sister Stephen Patrick and Sister Mariana. And uh, Sister Mia Forsati is taking the picture. So we'll, we'll see her later. Uh, their, their order has gotten a lot of publicity <laughs> because they're, they're always in the news, it seems. They were on the Game Show Network's American Bible Challenge where they did amazingly well. I, I watched and they won $50,000, including $10,000 as being voted the fan favorite group. And they used that money to help the elderly sisters who are retiring. Uh, they've been on Oprah. <laughs> twice, who um, praised them for their sensible shoes, as I remember. But Oprah was pretty taken uh, with the sisters. They've also been on Fox News. Uh, they, they also have a, a hit CD out. So uh, there's Sister Maria Forsati with Sister Teresa Christie and uh, Sister Mariana down at the bookstore at the Shrine. Uh, you can see. I don't know if this work. We'll see. This is in their chapel, but they recorded it. So buy their CD. They're awesome. A Grammy Award winning person to produce it. They also have last week just released their row three CD. So you can get it too. Okay, what about the future for the sisters? Um, where are they headed next? Uh, what does the future look like? Are any other young women interested in following this beautiful way of life? Uh, like I say, when I looked on the internet to find if there's signs of vocations for the future, well, there's this, and this, and this, and selfishly, I'm hoping maybe even this. Uh, I saw this picture on their Facebook page, and I'm like, that's Atchison. And so this sister is actually on the roof of one of the, the uh, buildings at Benedictine College in Atchison. So maybe that could be in their future, too. Hint, hint, sisters. Um, so uh, I, I really enjoyed interviewing Sister Teresa and getting to know their community, and I really like them, and I, I hope you like my presentation. And most especially, I, I hope you, you like the sisters like Sister Mariana uh, suggests there. Thanks. Questions? Yes? The dog. The dog. Uh, the statue out in front of the Dominican house uh, of uh, St. Dominic has a dog at his feet. Uh, have they kept up that symbolism, or what does it suggest to them today? 
uh, it, it, it suggests to them today that yes, they keep the, the symbol as a sign of their desire to go out and spread the gospel. That's the, the torch that the dog holds in its mouth. It's meant to be the light of the gospel and they're running forth to bark the good news. Yes, canus domini, domini canus, hound of the Lord, doggy of the Lord. Anything else? They're awesome. You should talk to them. Uh, Are you they're great. I, I, no, I, I, I do think I, after talking with Sister Teresa Christie, I might have missed my calling as a Dominican sister, but uh, awesome. All right, thanks.